Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to our town hall meeting. And thank you to Heather Gibbons, our ASL interpreter, for supporting today's events. Um, as all of you know, yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day, um, and so I hope everybody was able to learn a little bit about the Indigenous people of the area and engage in a lot of activities during school. I was able to pop into a school assembly, um, so that was a lot of fun um, to kick off the day yesterday. Sorry about my phone. Um, today, I'm also joined by Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Cashel Toner, and Executive Director of College and Career Readiness, Dr. Caleb Perkins, who will share updates and answer questions on priority learning standards and grading. Um, first, no matter the circumstances, Seattle Public Schools is committed to providing high quality instruction to all students. Ms. Toner and Dr. Perkins are going to explain more about the ways SPS, along with districts across Washington, are prioritizing state learning standards and making sure grading practices are anti-racist and equitable in a remote learning setting. Before I pass it over to them, I want to share some important updates. We had over 500 applicants to our remote learning task force. Previously, it was called the Reopening Plan and Remote Learning Task Force. Um, so thank you to all who applied to help us refine and continuously improve remote learning for this school year. I do apologize if there was confusion about what this task force was actually going to help us think through. We've corrected the title so it more accurately reflects the charge of this task force. Um, so the charge is to help us determine what types of things we should be looking at to gauge our success during remote learning and where can we make some course corrections. We now have a committee and a rubric that's sorting through all the applications um, to select the people who will make sure and will make sure the task force represents the diversity of our district and our students um, and we'll share more information about that task force very soon. We are committed to working with all of you to build on what's working and to address what isn't working during remote learning. We'll be centering the voices of our families and students through a survey that um, is being sent to students in grades K3 through 12, um, being sent to families and being sent to staff starting next week. Your feedback from these surveys will be used to, uh, by schools and the remote learning task force to monitor progress and to make adjustments to how we deliver instruction and support students during this remote learning time. We'll send another survey out in January, and then we'll also send out our annual school climate survey that is given in the spring. And um, we'll share those results publicly after the window closes. But I know that the question on many of our families' minds is when students will be able to return to school buildings for in-person learning. We'll soon have a small number of students with IEPs um, in our buildings for limited in-person services. The IEP teams supporting these students have determined that these students' IEP goals can only be met if they are in person. In alignment with our priorities, we will prioritize in-person supports for students who need them most while continuing to support the health and well-being of students and staff. We do not have any immediate plans to reopen for a broader group of students. However, we are actively preparing for a return to buildings. Last week, staff presented safety protocols for classrooms and transportation at a board work session and the reopening leadership team that we had put together um, prior to returning this fall, um, made up of parents, community partners, educators, staff and students We'll be meeting this week to assess our current context and to determine next steps. As we've said from day one of this pandemic, our priority is the health and well being of our students, our staff, and our larger community. We're also committed to providing predictability and consistency for our families. We're closely monitoring neighboring districts and national school systems. And we've seen some districts push reopening dates back repeatedly, and we've seen schools reopen their doors only to close them again. We know that rolling closures create more uncertainty and place more burden on families and students, 
We want to do this transition right, and we want to do it only once. We know that having a date by which we will make a decision about the rest of the year and have the criteria for providing in-person instruction to more students is top of mind for many, and we will have more information to share with you very soon. In the meantime, we will be creative and innovative in our approach to remote learning. We are no longer limited by the walls of our buildings and our educators and staff are doing an incredible job of thinking outside the box. We're actively exploring outdoor and community education pilots in response to the board's resolution. These are potential trial runs of outdoor learning opportunities for students and those pilots will inform the work of a future community and outdoor education task force. Applications to engage in those pilots will be sent to school leaders and educators this Thursday. So please watch for those. Um, uh, we're excited about the pilots rolling out and to see what kinds of innovative practices we can put into place. In this remote setting, we've also been able to extend programs that affirm our students' identities and lived experiences, like our Sakachi High School course and Kingmakers program for students across the district. Both programs offer students a place of community building and belonging. For our native youth, Sakachi supports school engagement and academic progress in a culturally sensitive environment. And Kingmakers of Seattle Extended, which will begin um, in the second semester, it might be starting sooner than that, um, is also an opportunity for black male students across the district to share experiences, participate in affirming curriculum that addresses stereotypes and focuses on their cultural identity and helps to elevate their voice. In a traditional school setting, these programs were only available to a small group of students um, because we were constrained by brick and mortar, but remote learning has allowed us to exp expand these programs beyond the walls of select school buildings and to create more access for more students across our system. I also want to thank our school leaders for their innovation and their commitment to students. October is Principal Appreciation Month and so many of you have reached out with stories of gratitude for your school's principal. Alice, a mother of an eighth grade student at Mercer Middle School, sent us an email sharing I want to thank our daughter's principal, Cindy Waters. She's been available, responsive, thoughtful, and honest in getting online school up this fall. Thank you so much for being all in. We see it and we appreciate you. We love to hear hashtag thank a principal stories like this one. Please add your story in the comments, send us an email, or mention us in your post on social media, and we'll continue to share these stories throughout the month. There's so much to honor and acknowledge this month. Not only is October Principal Appreciation Month, but it's also Filipino American Heritage Month, National Physical Therapy Month, Disability History Awareness Month, National Bullying Prevention Month, and Farm to School Month. And yesterday, as I mentioned, we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day. Did you know that your school district's top leadership, the board president, the board vice president and me, the superintendent, are all native. That made Indigenous Peoples Day particularly special for Seattle Public Schools. Please make sure you follow SPS on Facebook and Instagram at Seattle Public Schools and on Twitter at SEAPUB Schools and are signed up for our weekly newsletter School Beat to read about the various ways we are honoring these commemorative holidays. I'll now pass it over to Kishel Toner and Kayla Perkins to talk more about priority learning standards and grading during remote learning. Thanks for being here. I think Kishel's up first. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Superintendent Juneau. Um, okay, so hello. My name is Kishel Toner and I am the Executive Director of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction. I'm pleased for us to have this opportunity to talk about how your CAI team Oh, that stands for the Department of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction uh, in Seattle Public Schools. So we're going to talk to you about how the CAI team um, has approached responding to opening schools in a remote model. 
The CAI team is made up of curriculum managers and master teachers who are experts in their content area. So think about math, science, English language arts, PE, and so on. Um, the first thing to understand is that our CAI team takes this work very, very seriously. And uh, we've been working literally all summer long to develop useful tools and guidance for educators. So you might be wondering, where do we begin? We grounded our work by taking a look at the dosage and instructional models available. So that means the specific content um, time that we would have for instruction. And then we thought about synchronous and asynchronous instruction. Um, that means things we would teach or that lend themselves to being taught in a live setting or maybe lessons that can be recorded and accessed um, at a different time. And then we relied heavily on the work done by the Council of Great City Schools and their guidance about reopening school districts. The Council of Great City Schools is an organization that supports large urban districts like Seattle and they share research and current best practice thinking. In order to promote consistency and coherence, we have shared a very similar presentation with our school principals um, at our School Leaders Institute. And we also, also shared this in information with about 6,000 educators um, virtually in a professional development session. Um, this is important because we needed our school leaders to be informed about our instructional approach, and we needed our educators to be oriented to the tools available to them. So because school was interrupted in March last year, we are thinking a lot about the idea of unfinished learning. By thinking about unfinished learning from last year and by using the tools that CAI um, developed, we can consider how to accelerate learning for our students. CAI began this process by grounding our work in the six principles addressed in this article published by the Council of Great City Schools. This is a strength-based approach rather than a deficit model. We are not remediating our students, but rather we are teaching grade level content and providing just-in-time supports if and when students need them. This guidance takes the approach that in the spring learning was unfinished and instruction should address grade level content with intentional scaffolds and supports. So in summary, what does that mean? It means that when we're teaching this year, we're thinking about sticking to grade level content. We're focusing on depth of instruction rather than pace. We're prioritizing content and learning, um, utilizing the tools that the curriculum assessment and instruction team built for educators. We're maintaining inclusion um, for each and every learner. We're identifying and addressing gaps in learning through instruction and we're focusing on commonalities across content areas. This is really important. This daily re-engagement of prior knowledge in the context of grade level assignments will add up over time, resulting in more functional learning than if we were to resort on watered down instruction to try to reteach topics out of context. Again, this messaging was shared with principals and educators. So you might be wondering, what might this look like inside of third grade reading block? Well, we would um, give guidance to our educators that we would like for them to hold on to grade level text, practice differentiation. That's sort of education speak for thinking about um, what each one of the learners needs in your classroom and then adjusting your instruction accordingly. We would like to enhance opportunities to learn knowledge and vocabulary. We would keep doing read alouds, just like we would do in bricks and mortar. We can do that virtually. We would like to have our teachers using available text sets and keep kids and students spending time reading. Um, we would want our educators to connect content. Um, so for example, um, if you're teaching about nonfiction text, you might make a connection between science and English language arts. We would not rush our foundational skills, um, especially our early learners, preschool through second grade, need lots of time with their foundational skills and reading. And then we would ask our educators to access new training opportunities. Our department has um, offered many, many, many hours of professional learning um, for educators virtually um, starting in the summertime and then actually as, as most recently as last Friday. 
Okay, so wow, that's a lot to think about. You might be wondering, how are we approaching actualizing this guidance that you just learned about? The CAI team worked all summer long to develop tools for educators. In fact, many, many, many Seattle Public Schools educators worked alongside our content managers to, de to develop these tools. Tools like priority standards by content area and by grade level, pacing guides and weekly pacing guides. So we've built websites um, and have all of these tools uh, available to our Seattle Public Schools educators. So in summary, we learned from the Council of Great City Schools guidance. We developed tools to align with this guidance. We taught these ideas to our principals and our educators and built um, resources to support educa uh, our educators to actualize these ideas. So um, in a nutshell, we are going to stick with grade level content and instructional rigor. We're going to focus on content and learning and so on. Now that's a quick summary of some really big ideas. So I think we'll take some time um, after my colleague Kayla Perkins talks to you um, to take some questions at the end. If you want to hear more about um, how Seattle Public Schools is organizing our priority standards um, to teach in the remote context. So with that, I'll pass this over to Dr. Kayla Perkins. Thank you, Gachelle. As was shared, I'm Kayla Perkins. I'm the Executive Director for College and Career Readiness. And building off of what Cashel was sharing, we are uh, not only prioritizing standards, but developing grading practices that try to promote uh, racial equity and anti-racist practices per Superintendent Juno's point. I am grateful for the opportunity to share a few points about that work and then to take your questions on the work we're doing to ensure grading is in fact promoting equity. Let me first start with the grading policy for this year. In August, the board approved a policy where for middle and high school students, the final grading options are only A through C minus or an incomplete. That means that students will have the opportunity to uh, earn credit and earn a grade through of A through C minus, or if they're unable to get to that level, they'll receive an incomplete and the opportunity to, to make up that class. Um, and that gives a number of extra supports for students during this, this uh, time of remote learning. In addition, the policy includes a number of steps we were gonna ask uh, teachers to take to help support students who are at risk of receiving an incomplete so that students have every opportunity to show what they've learned and every opportunity to, to make progress towards earning the credits and taking the next steps in their education. That's for middle and high school students, again, A through C minus or incomplete. At the elementary level, we'll continue to have uh, students receive information on how, what progress they're making towards the standards that Cashel just spoke about, those priority standards. And students and families will be able to, to understand what progress students uh, are making, as well as hearing what we're calling robust comments or detailed comments about uh, how students are doing across key content areas and other areas. In implementing this policy, we're working to meet a number of shared goals, uh, goals shared across a number of stakeholders and groups. One such goal is, of course, what Superintendent uh, Juno referenced, which is the goal of racial equity and to promote anti-racism in everything that we do. Another is to ensure that grading is, in fact, communicating learning. That's, in essence, what grading should mostly uh, be about, is communicating learning to students and families. We also want to provide extra supports during this time. Again, knowing that students and families are going through a wide variety of experiences and we want to make sure there are those extra supports. And at the same time, we want to maintain high expectations to get to the mission and vision of Seattle Public Schools to ensure all students graduate ready for college, career and community. I call them uh, shared goals because they've been developed and refined through many conversations with a variety of groups for the last several months, including students, such as members of the Student Leadership Council that are part of the Office of African American Male Achievement, educators and school leaders, including uh, leaders and educators from Franklin High School, Chief Self High School, and Ballard High School, as well as a number of key stakeholders, including members of the Seattle Education Association leadership and the Seattle Council PTSA. Without them, we would not be able to have uh, the robust set of guidance that we've developed, and we're very grateful. Specifically, to help meet our goals for grading, uh, these conversations have led us to three pillars, and in particular, uh, a book by Joseph Feldman about grading for equity. In brief, we want grading to meet three pillars. One, to be accurate, to ensure that it's giving information about what students know and are able to do, 
based on specific standards like the priority standards Kishel spoke to. We want grading to be bias resistant, uh, avoiding assignments that may be impacted by implicit bias. Uh, implicit bias. And we want it, grading to be motivational. We want it to promote student interest in learning and promote a growth mindset. Because when students uh, believe that they can learn something and teachers believe in students, that's when we see some of the greatest gains. What are some of the specific ways we're trying to promote these pillars and meet these goals? Well, one thing is we're promoting best practices. We want our teachers across the district to give students many opportunities for retakes as one best practice. We want to give uh, uh, regular information and updates to families about how students are doing as another best practice. We want to really have grading focus on information around whether students are meeting standards as opposed to uh, grading assess uh, behavior or other factors that are less about learning. So that's one thing that we're doing. Another step we're taking to promote best practices is to have a robust incomplete process. And that what that means is that teachers need to really make sure they're providing a number of supports for students before a student receives an incomplete. This includes checking in with students and their families every other week uh, if they're at risk of receiving an, of earning an incomplete and using Wednesday early release time to provide one on one supports and connections with those students to see what supports they need, as well as to connect to existing teams like IEP teams and 504 teams. Uh, in addition, we are going to continue to allow teachers to have access to D's and E's uh, and E's being the failing grade for assignment grades. And this allows teachers to give students more precise feedback on the work that they're doing uh, over the course of the year. It also helps us design interventions for students who most need it. So, th so there's some of the things that we're trying to do in the short term. Longer term, we're looking to the many inspiring SBS educators who are engaged in what's called standards-based grading, where grading really is tied deeply and specifically to the mastery of the knowledge and skills that students most need to be ready for college, career, and community. And together with all of the groups that I referenced earlier, students, stakeholders, educators, and school leaders, we're looking forward to implementing our short and long-term goals and meeting those pillars and truly getting to grading for equity. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of that overview, and now I will turn it back to the group for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb, and thank you, Kashal. Uh, we do have a couple questions that came in. Kashal, um, just like strip it down, right? Of like, tell us exactly, talk to us a little bit about priority standards, and um, can you, sort of just give an example to people, like how 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 will it, what does it look like, I guess? Sure, sure. I can try um, to, I can try to do that. Let's see what happens. This is complex work though, right? Because um, when you think about all of the grades, we're talking about preschool through grade 12, all the different content areas um, inside of each one of those grades, but I'll try. Um, so um, let's see, so things like in first grade, an ELA student would need to be able to um, ask and answer questions about text. That would be a priority standard for first grade. Um, another one might be something like describe character settings and major events in a story. Okay, so those are some priority standards that a first grade student would want to, we'd want them to know and be able to do inside of ELA. Now, when you think about math, um, those are the skills that um, potentially um, build on each other across the grades and across the year. So um, maybe a fourth grade student would be working on comparing fractions um, at this time in the school year. But let's say that the educator um, notices that many of the kids might not have mastered some of the multiplication uh, work that really helps you be more fluent with comparing fractions. So an educator might provide a scaffold or a support uh, inside of that grade level context, which would be comparing fractions and really give some more activities around multiplication um, skills. OK, so there's an example of a grade level standard or priority standard in math and then a scaffold and then some ELA first grade, um, you, you know, what we would want you to know and be able to do. OK, thank you. Um, and Caleb, like just explain a little bit about what the process will be. Um, what process will be followed before a student actually receives an incomplete? Yeah, I think it's one of the really important ways we're taking extra steps to ensure students are getting the supports they need. In brief, we're asking all teachers with their students who are at risk of earning an incomplete to check in every other week 
with those students starting now at the mid-quarter mark, uh, which is actually today, October 13th. Um, and so that will be the, the expectation going forward. We'll ask them to even document that, that checking in with students and their families. Um, and that's one key way. The other piece is to take advantage of the time that we've built into the schedules we've built for remote learning on Wednesdays in particular to check in with those students. And together, those are two key building blocks to ensure that many of the students who might, uh, uh, without extra help, receive an incomplete will be able to get to that, that A through C minus level and, uh, and earn their credits. And then there's a question about how does the grading policy um, work with Running Start or college in the high school? So in brief, the the we control our transcripts with the Seattle Public Schools and the colleges control their transcripts. So as just as happened in the spring, the students would likely receive two grades. One grade that would go in the college transcript following their grading practices, I'm uh, sorry, grading policy, and one following ours, meaning that whatever grade would be either converted to an A through a C minus or an incomplete before it goes on our transcript. Thank you. And then Kashel, um, how do you, uh, figure out SCL or are there priority learn standards for SCL or how are those incorporated? Okay, so that's a, that, that's fun to talk about actually. So the um, SCL is social emotional learning, right? And so that's th practices that educators, th those are the things teachers sort of just do when we're in bricks and mortar, right? It's the way you greet children walking into your classroom. It's the way you're standing in the hallway of a middle school and, you know, relate to kids and say hello right, to build that emotional um, relationship um, because teaching and learning, um, actually learning and teaching take trust. It takes a lot of trust to really take a risk and learn something new. Um, and so that's why it's really important to attend to the SEL needs of teachers and of kids. So we've, you can see evidence of that built into our schedules. Um, so you can see that there's actually um, inside of the schedule something called uh, family connection, right? And that time is intended for one-on-one -on -one opportunities for educators to connect with kids and families because we know that this uh, remote learning model needs to take place in partnership with caregivers and families, right? So you can see that time to check in. Um, you can also see in the morning times of many, many elementary schools and middle, middle and high as well, um, start the day off with sort of a morning meeting um, because those rituals and those um, predictable um, practices, uh, those provide comfort and they're um, Kids like them, teachers like them, and you know kind of what's coming. Actually, grown-ups do too. But anyway, um, many, many, many classes are starting with like a morning meeting to just check and connect and say good morning and say hello and say, how are you today? Um, and you matter and you're important and I'm happy you're here. Then we have SEL um, practices built inside of uh, many of our instructional materials um, across the day. So it's two things. It's the standalone practice in time for the intentionality around the SEL practices, but then it's also woven throughout the day um, because that's the real power of, um, you know, strong teaching is that human connection. I hope that helps. Yeah, no, super important um, about, you know, making sure that SEL gets integrated into, uh, particularly in this remote setting, super hard things that are happening and people are, I know the struggle is, um, there's just a lot of struggles right now and challenges. And so appreciate educators weaving that into what they're doing. I think we have can have one more um, last question and we will go to Caleb about what should robust comments look like in the elementary report? I'm going to defer to my uh, expert colleague in the K-5 space, uh, Kishel. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to talk about that one. So robust comments. Um, you know, we could have put a different word in there. Um, don't don't hold on too much to the word robust, but really what we would like our educators to do is to give um, information to families um, about the whole, about their child, right? How, how are you doing um, social, emotionally? How are you doing um, with your academic trajectory? Um, and so um, because uh, we don't have the more frequent connection with families and, and kids in the face-to-face -face setting, we're going to rely heavily on our um, mechanisms to communicate with each other. And so that's just one of them um, that we've asked our um, elementary teachers to still use the report card, right, and to report towards standard with the one, two, three, and four, but then to also take um, a little I would say more time because it really shouldn't be more time, but really thoughtful reflection um, on communicating with families about each student's progress socially, emotionally, and academically. 
Yeah, thank you both. And thank you again to Ms. Toner and Dr. Perkins for joining us today. Um, I'll be hosting these virtual town hall events monthly to share updates and answer questions. Next month, we'll focus on asynchronous or independent learning. So join us on November 10th at 4.30 p.m. via Facebook, YouTube, SPS TV, or Teams Live. And I hope to see you then. Um, I know there's still a lot of questions and we're, we're continue to communicate as things progress. And so please continue to subscribe to all our social media challenges. Um, get on School Beat if you're not receiving that yet. Um, and I just really want to give one last shout out to our school leaders for Principal Appreciation Month. Thank you um, to Seattle Public Schools principals and assistant principals for all that you do for our school communities. We could not be doing all that we are doing without you. So thank you so much and thanks everybody for joining us today. We'll get to um, some more questions at the next uh, next Facebook Live.